One, two, three. Tonight they're shutting down the borders and they boarded up the school. Small towns are rolling up the sidewalks. One last paycheck's coming through. I know you're feeling kind of nervous. We're all a little bit confused. Nothing's the same. This ain't a game. We gotta make it through. When you can do what you do, you do what you can. This ain't my prayer. It's just a thought I'm wanting to send. Round here we bend, but don't break. Down here we all understand. You can't do what you do. You do what you can. As we wave outside the window, older loved ones stay inside. Moms and babies blowing kisses, babies saving someone's life. They had to cancel graduation. It ain't fair to scap the prom. Our kids at home in isolation. TV news is always on. When you can't do what you do, you do what you can. This ain't my prayer, it's just a thought I'm wanting to send. Down here we fail, but don't break. Down here we all understand. You can't do what you do, you do what you can. They built a hospital on East Meadow in Central Park last night. Doctors, nurses, truckers, grocery store clerks, man in the front line. I saw Red Cross on the Hudson. They turned off the Broadway lights. Another ambulance screams by. There by the grace of God for I. So love yourself and love your family. Love your neighbor and your friend. Any time we love the stranger, that just a friend you ain't met yet. We're gonna get through this together until I see you once again. When you can't do what you do, you do what you can. You see my prayer, it's just a thought I'm wanting to send. Round here we bend, but don't break. Down here we all understand. You can't do what you do, you do what you can. When you can't do what you do, you do what you can. Welcome, everybody, and uh, thank you, John Bon Jovi. And even if you're not from New Jersey, you sure like some inspiration from, uh, from Bon Jovi there. I want to welcome everybody to our fifth town hall, and you are in for a treat today. Um, just a little couple of reminders on how we operate here. These town halls are all about participation. And I see we have quite a few of you out there. Uh, we drive this session on Q&A. So if you look on your screen, you should have a Q&A button and we would love to hear from you uh, starting immediately. You can start dropping your questions uh, that you have for our panelists. Speaking of panelists, if we could go to the next slide. I'd like to remind you who's on board with us today. Of course, I'll be here for the duration of the call I ask answering any of your questions regarding security or front desk. We have Juan Jose Chavez from Plans, who's happy to answer any of your janitorial maintenance questions. Welcome to the group. Uh, Nick today will be uh, able to answer any of your IT questions from Plans, anything around technology during COVID-19. Of course, we have Martin Cavallar, our uh, for all of our legal questions. Ray Venturino from FIRE. Uh, joining us again today to answer any of your fire questions, Jeff Shipman for fitness. Uh, he's here from Heartline. Ben Bosch, who you saw and met last week, will be here to answer any of your 
pool questions. And of course, we welcome and we're very excited to have Michael Fazio from Live here with us today, who is our featured presenter. And with that said, and without any further ado, I'm going to turn it over to you, Mr. Fazio. Thank you. Let's try that again. Thanks, Dino. And congratulations to the, the entire plan family. You guys are pulling off something really amazing and really needed. And um, I'm very happy to be participating with you. So today I am going to be talking a little bit about um, exactly what John Bon Jovi sang about, where when you can't do what you do, you do what you can. And um, I'll tell you how that relates to the context of today. Um, but also want to just give you a little background information quickly about me and my company. My name is Michael Fazio. Um, I started a company 17 years ago with my business partner, Abby. It was called Abigail Michaels Concierge. We were predominantly a hospitality style concierge service that was retained by luxury properties in Manhattan. Um, we saw that there was a need to expand our our repertoire and we merged with American Leisure and American Pools to create um, Live Unlimited, which is a full service, 360 degree amenity management and concierge service. Concierge not in the planned definition with front desk and lobby, but um, more like the dinner reservations and theater tickets and entertainment and all of the kind of stuff that a hotel concierge would do. Um, just some fun things. Uh, got out of the operational side and got into the creative side. Um, I was lucky enough a number of years ago, though I'm still living in the past, to have written a book called Concierge Confidential, which was a bestseller. It was on Amazon's top 100 for over a year. Um, and I uh, have now kind of pivoted into the role of all creative with Live Unlimited. So if we can go to the next slide. Just to give you a little background on Oh, I think we're missing a slide actually. The very first Live Unlimited slide, maybe before me. Nope, it was there before. Oh, oh, keep going. One more. Nope, okay. Live Unlimited is a company that does four primary things. First of all, we staff, manage, and operate amenity spaces. So everything from the gym to the resident screening room to the kids' playroom to um, in some of these buildings that we operate in now to the bowling alley to the underground soccer field, we staff, manage, and operate the entire facility. We also provide lifeguards for the pool and manage all of the aquatics. And then what I'm going to be talking about today is we're responsible for creating all of the programming for the buildings. So if there's story time in the kids lounge, that's us. If there's a wine tasting or a culinary event, that's us behind the planning process. And what happened obviously for many, if not all of us with the COVID crisis is these spaces got shut down and our lifeblood is based on engagement. We are lucky enough to have a very robust technology and chief information officer who has innovated some amazing technology that gives us the opportunity to capture all of the matrix metrics on usage, how many people are attending our events, how many people are engaging with our content. Um, but what happens when there's nowhere for people to gather, there's no engagement. And where there's no engagement, there's no reason for us. And you know, it, the, the domino effect takes place. So the developers and property managers are coming to us and you know, saying, you're not able to do anything. So how about if we just postpone our relationship until this is over? And then residents are going to property managers and developers and saying, so we pay a monthly fee that includes social activations and access to the fitness facilities and those are closed. So can we just postpone paying for that until this crisis is over? So we um, quickly tried to make lemonade out of the lemons and we went to a virtual approach to activation, similar to what you're doing here. You know, you're using the opportunity to be kind of stuck in to innovate and get creative about finding ways to bring people together. So you can flip to the next slide. So where we used to do everything in the space, we had to now shift to doing everything 
online and through Zoom. And also we've really leveraged social media and brand of our own brand and our clients. So there are basically three components to how we're engaging right now in this, in this digital virtual age. And we're gonna start with fitness. So this is a key need for everybody in our buildings. A lot of people live in buildings specifically because of the fabulous gyms they have. Um, as we're all shut in now, we also know that we're going a little stir crazy and exercise and well-being is more important than ever. And so we are creating, or we started creating from the middle of March up until now and ongoing, two live streaming fitness classes every day. And we do a 10 o'clock and a one o'clock, Monday through Friday. And then on Saturdays and Sundays, we do a 10 o'clock. And we've tried to look at our building analytics because we want to play to the masses. We can't just do what works for one building for one type of client because now we're casting a very broad net to our entire client population, not building by building, but more on a holistic approach. So whether we're doing a nutritional workshop or we've done meditation workshops, we've done strength training, core training, ab classes, yoga. So every day this engagement is happening. Um, and what we've learned is, first of all, our engagement per capita, and this is gonna sound a little misleading, so I wanna make sure I'm saying this right, that it's per capita. Based on our followers, our engagement, the number of people in our classes is three times higher than the number of people that have been in Equinox's classes. So what, what we're taking away from that is, during a time like this, people are probably, this is indicating to us that people are probably gravitating to things that are more familiar to them. So they know your brand, they know your building, they live in the building, they're looking for things that are familiar. And it's, it's very different than just going to, you know, fitness.com and, and logging into some random class with a random instructor that you don't know with a brand you don't know. And we're finding there's, there's kind of a, a sense of community that's being, that's being generated by that. The other part is through digital and virtual engagement, we're able to track just like we were in live engagement. So we're getting to know our residents, including people that were sometimes not members of the fitness facility, or maybe never partook in our classes in the past. And now we're noticing new names. So it's another interesting takeaway. Um, building familiarity and community. I think that because people are now coming to us as a habit, they're, they have something common with one another to relate to when they have their own Zoom meetings with neighbors or when we get back to normalcy they will be able to reference this experience that they all shared together. And what I think is interesting about doing it, you know, small brand versus big box brand is they're going to keep going back, whether you're hosting it on your building site or driving them through the amenity management company, Live Unlimited, it's, it's a smaller population. It's more relatable. Everybody has something in common. So I think that's a really great, um, take away from this. And also when we are driving them to one central channel, we or the buildings, some of our buildings are doing this on their own channels with our programming, but you can reinforce your message. So if whether it's safety information that you need to give out, whether it's information about reopening, whether it's just a pep talk, you have them as an audience. So, you know, these are like your opportunities to do a commercial. And then most of all, I think the fact that we have stepped up and created something that we didn't have before, you know, this was about innovating on the spot. We did not do streaming fitness until March 18th. Um, we're showing them that they're important enough to us that we're doing new things and we're, you know, we're stretching our comfort zone and we're going outside the box to do something for them. And I am definitely seeing amazing goodwill. We have, clients and residents who are literally on our activations chatting to each other in the chat bar. So it's just witnessing all of this through the fitness and well-being side has been very powerful. And I think that, you know, if you don't have a build, uh, if you don't have an amenity management company managing your amenities, you can still do versions of this. You know, nothing's as easy as it seems on the surface. 
I'm certainly happy to talk to anybody who wants to bring Live Unlimited on board, but you know, don't think that this is impossible for you to do on your own. You have to create ways of staying in front of your residents and showing them that you care. And it's more than an email telling them not to use the elevator without a mask. So we can go to the next slide, which is the next component of our virtual programming, which has been all social engagement. And these are as successful as fitness, which surprised us. Um, we came up with a virtual event menu. And basically, we're lucky enough to have a creative team of four people, plus myself, who wake up in the morning and since COVID has started, we're looking for the cool things to do online. We're, we're thinking about things that we could produce online that would normally take place in buildings. And we put together a very robust menu. And every week we're doing at least one to three events, social events. And what we've tried to do is break it into categories. So again, we're casting a broad net. We're targeting kids and families. We know that kids are home. We know we have to, we have to use some logistics too. We don't wanna do a kid's event in the morning because the parents are working. We don't necessarily want to do a kids event in the evening because maybe everybody just needs to unplug a little bit. So we found success with kids events either on the weekends or at 1.30. Guess why? Because mom and dad are on their lunch break. So they have time to now entertain the kids with our help. We have cooking and nutrition. We've been doing mixology and wine tastings. We've even been doing some arts and crafts online, um, including kits that we send to residents so that they are prepared with everything they need before the virtual experience. We're organizing board games that you can play online. We're doing open mic nights. We've done some lectures and intellectual programming. And then we just have the basic social. And the four uh, images I have up there, just to give you examples of what people are responding to. And again, you can hunt this down. There is stuff out there probably that exists that you can just borrow from. Um, if you can't create it yourself. We've created this ourselves, but you know, there is information overload out there. And you know, if you have time to hunt it down, it's there. So we did something, you see this on the top left is Frozen. Um, we got a cast member from the Broadway musical Frozen who basically taught um, eight bars, uh, the song and the choreography, to about a hundred kids, it was so popular that we had to do a second one now. And it, I mean, I was on the event, and if you look at Zoom in grid format, you know, the, the whole screen fills with the little squares. And it was like almost, you know, kind of got me a little mushy because you saw all these like, you know, five, six, seven year old, mostly girls, just rocking out to Frozen with somebody who to them is John Bon Jovi because she plays the princess in Frozen. You're like, you couldn't be more famous to a six-year-old than that. So stuff like that has been great. Underneath that, we did a pasta making because I didn't know this, but pasta can be made with three ingredients and it can be made on a slab of stone or a cutting board. So it's something that's really easy. Even I was able to make it. And, you know, it's, again, it gives people a common story. Everybody from the building is logging into the same experience, whether they're communicating outside of the event, during the event, or after. We're bringing a sense of commonality to the table. So there'll be lots of discussions after this. Um, we did, we're doing virtual happy hours. Again, so popular, we're starting to do them twice a week now. So every Friday, we're doing a wine online with Sotheby's Wines. Um, if there's a local wine store by your building, contact them. I guarantee you they would be happy to participate to some level. And, you know, strangely, everybody keeps coming back on Friday to hear, we're calling it like Wine University, uh, because we have a curator from Sotheby's who's explaining each type of wine. And it's very informative. And she's got a great personality and is very engaging and it's working. Um, we also targeted the uh, pre-college people because college admissions is very stressful right now. So we brought on a college admissions coach and she gave basically an hour of Q&A and tips on how to navigate through COVID. So again, it's all about casting a broad net. You don't have to do 25 things a day, but you know, well thought out um, stuff that's out there online can be 
one step in the right direction if you don't have a company like Live Unlimited doing this for you. And then if you flip to the last one, the third type of engagement is that we're finding, especially since we're out of sight, out of mind right now, remember that we staff these spaces. So our people are not face to face with the residents. Our lifeblood is engagement. So when you're not face to face, it's, you know, you're easily forgotten. So what we've done is we've, we call these, we name them guide to inside um, because we're all stuck inside. And we also believe that there's a gigantic information overload. My mailbox fills up in an annoying way every morning, noon, and night. And I'm sure everybody has this experience with do this and do this online and try this event. And, you know, there's just so many things from, you know, shopping online to, um, I know that Ticketmaster is constantly sending stuff out saying like there's a virtual concert, but there's so much stuff that I couldn't keep um, bookmarking all of these sites. So we decided let's just give people short snippets, short bites and show them that we cared enough to find great stuff. So every week we highlight three to five really cool, really fun things that we see online. And then we've even started producing some of our own. So whether it's, um, you know, we pulled our, our uh, population and we got people to send in their favorite funny videos that have been circulating. So we put together our, you know, best of the crazy COVID videos. Um, we had an author over Passover and Easter talk about uh, taking advantage of this time to archive all your family heirloom recipes. So it's just creative content with links to things that are happening online. And in, again, it's another way of staying in front of people, staying relevant to the lifestyle that we're supposed to be creating for them. Even though we're not there, we have to keep this going you know it's wellness is not only about physical fitness it's about emotional well-being it's about social connection it's about building community and most of all all of this has really helped us to just keep things light and fluffy we are not here to tell them about you know all of the horrible things that are happening we're just here to say here's a little relief um, and we want to have as much upbeat time with you as we can so there you have it, what, what we're doing. Again, there's so much out there. I really encourage everybody to emulate this in any way that you can. And if you really feel it's too big or you really don't know if you have this time, then that's what companies like Live Unlimited are for. And we have a great, like we could start tomorrow. We have so much virtual content. Mr. Fazio, thank you so much. Awesome. What an incredible uh, presentation. Thank you. Thank uh, you. Always the professional. Uh, sorry about the uh, technical challenge there, but as usual, right. you, you go right through that and, and truly appreciate it. Um, so a couple of quick things before we turn it over to Q&A. Now is a great time to take our poll. Uh, Nick, do you have our poll? And panelists, please mute. I do, Dino. So today's poll is, uh, what time would be a more convenient date or time for this town hall series moving forward? Thursdays at 10, Wednesdays at 10, or Tuesdays at 10? So if everybody would just take a quick second and click on one, we'd greatly appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks for that, Nick. And, uh, you know, a little behind there, um, a lot of you have reached out. We appreciate, by the way, all the feedback that we're getting uh, about this presentation every week. Uh, we certainly want it to be convenient for you. As, as I've said, and we've said from the beginning, it's all about participation and all about you. Um, so certainly I saw plenty of questions coming in, Mr. Fazio, while you were presenting. Uh, there are several out there for you. So with that said, I would love and be honored to turn it over to Rob Francis, our CEO, to start our Q&A. Great job, Michael Fazio. Great content. Love the presentation. Thanks, Rob. Absolutely. And the I, panel that's there, you heard from before, so throw your Q&A to the panel as well. So 
Michael, we'll start with, are there any advantages to virtual programming over to the traditional on-site programming that we've been used to? And I think you've covered a little of it, but um, what are those advantages? And are you getting the feedback either on polling or surveys from everyone about what content you're showing and how is it received? Yeah. So first of all, thank you for not asking the question that I saw most recurring, which was, is he almost done? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that was not. <laughs> uh, so there are a couple of advantages. First of all, what we've noticed through this fun phenomenon of COVID is that there were a lot of new people in our platform that were not previous engagers. So we have a very robust technology. We, we have resident lists. We were able to see who participates in what, and that helps us, helps inform the types of programming that we do. Um, and one of, the, one of the things that I found very interesting was we have a lot of the usual suspects. There are, there are pockets of populations in every property of the people that will go to every event and will be very active in the building. And then there are people that are just very, they're enigmas. We, we never really hear from them, positive or negative. And, you know, we're always trying to increase the number of people who we reach because it adds value to what we do and it keeps the building engaged and an engaged building obviously has more retention and therefore is more valuable. So the advantage is we're getting people that we didn't get before. Right. Um, couldn't explain it, but maybe that's part of the, you know, some people are shy and Absolutely. online, you don't have to put your camera on if you don't want. Right. You know, so, the so maybe way for people to start engaging and communicating yes. like this has opened up, I'm sure a whole new audience for, for you and for the buildings to start getting more of the community right. by getting involved. I mean, in a few of our properties, they charge a membership fee to use the fitness facility, but because of COVID and just to spread goodwill, we've encouraged everybody just to open up the classes, like don't gate them. Everybody needs to do a 20 minute stretch every day. Um, but what's happened there where we're getting people that were non-members is we'll work with the building now to target those people to become, you know, convert them into paying members because we all know that those membership fees help offset the cost of running the amenities. Nobody's ever going to make a profit on it, but amenities are expensive. Programming is expensive. So the more people who engage, the more opportunity there is to offset the cost. Absolutely. And so what do you think um, of the virtual programs that you're offering today? Do you think you're going to continue on this path or um, after this crisis and everybody's hopefully back to work and engaging, what do you see happening next? Is this now a new kind of vehicle that's going to continue in conjunction with the live programming or what do you see happening next? That's a, a great question. And I actually do, you know, whether we get back 100% normal or a new normal, I definitely believe most of all that the live, not necessarily streaming, but these live group fitness classes are going to continue for a number of reasons. A lot of buildings don't have vast group fitness space, um, which sometimes I think can be a deterrent for people participating because you know it's hard to get it's hard to get a space in the room. You're on top of one another. Sometimes the sound systems aren't professional. So this is definitely I see a, an alternative way to keep people engaged with the fitness amenity. Um, I also think that some of the lectures that we're doing, we've, we've worked with a psychotherapist who you know, ran a Q&A to help people adjust to being around their spouse 24 hours a day. So these kind of discussion groups, we've done things with authors, we've done things with emerging filmmakers. Um, those are kind of niche programs. And I think that if we keep them virtual, a, it's that shyness thing. We will probably get more participation. And it's also just easier to log into a Zoom chat session with a subject matter expert than it is to, you know, take yeah. a shower, fix your hair like mine, you know, <laughs> go, go and be in front of people. So I think that there is definitely a place to continue this. I, I, I see it as well. For your uh, world, and I think for all the business worlds we're in, what this 
kind of has shown us in terms of what effective communication and uh, how business can look like going forward. So right. love it. I'm going to give you a little bit of a break. And I threw a couple at you and okay. give panelists a little bit, just amazing. But I'm going to stay in the amenity space and go like a one, two punch. I'm going to go to Jeff uh, from Heartline for a second. And then I'm going to go to Martin on a legal question on the amenity space. So Jeff, when should we prepare to open our fitness facilities? Uh, great, great question. Um, hopefully you've already started to prepare, uh, really is the first part of that answer. And as far as, um, bringing a provider in to disinfect, protect, clean, things like that, um, now's the time. It's the safest time for, for any company to bring in their employees. If a space has been shut down, uh, it's obviously a little bit more concerning once we do open it up. Uh, and, and there's potential for, you know, infection and things like that. And you're continuing with that cleaning. So really now is the time, whether it's you've started your plan, finalize your plan, get it done. Uh, understand how you're going to react to changes from the state. Uh, if you do have an incidence, once you're opened up, put all those pieces together. Now your residents are going to want to know the answer, no matter what the situation and as this fluid situation changes. So your plan absolutely should have been started already and you should be finalizing it. And really right now for cleaning, disinfecting, things like that, uh, where you're bringing people in to prep the space. Yes. Do that now. It's the safest time to do that. Uh, if you have those providers that can get in. Thank you. And then for Martin, is it recommended to have residents sign a waiver for amenity use? Uh, just quickly before getting into that, to add to what Jeff said, you should not be, you certainly want to prepare to open all these facilities, but you should not be opening them until you're allowed to. So check, you know, with your council, check uh, state to state is going to be different. I know in New Jersey, um, for example, they announced, you know, golf courses and state parks can be open. And um, we got an influx of questions today from managers and from our board members asking, does that mean they could open their pool? Can they open their playground? Can they open, um, their gym, the answer to that is really still no. When you look at the governor's order, what he's talking about is like passive activities. So opening open spaces for jogging and running, not opening um, a tennis court, for example, was one of the other examples that people use, or kids' playgrounds. It specifically says this is not meant to be for playgrounds. Things that you'd be touching, that type of thing, still need to stay closed, at least in New Jersey anyway. Uh, and then with respect to the waiver, the, the question you asked, I, I don't know that you, or I don't think you should have people sign a, a waiver with, with respect to COVID-19. What I do think you should be doing is when the facilities open back up and they are allowed to be open, you may post signage, right? And you might um, tell people what it is you're doing, um, what protocols you've put in place with respect to cleaning, disinfect, disinfecting, or maybe rules and regulations that didn't exist before that exist now when you go and use the gym. What you should have though, and I talked about this a couple of weeks ago, is a, a waiver for gym use in general. Um, anytime you go to any gym that's not part of your community association, you're required to sign a waiver. Associations should have a similar waiver and it would cover everything from COVID to personal injury. Um, it's essentially understanding that you're using that space at your own risk. You want that general waiver. Do you need one specific to COVID-19? No. Do you need a general one? Yes, always. While we're together, I'm going to ask you one more. Can an association restrict guests, I guess, to to utilize a private pool, to use their pool? I think that's what... Uh, so, yeah, no, a lot of people have asked, well, you know, if, if a single family homeowner has a, a pool, they're allowed to use that. Can an association say, okay, as long as it's only our residents, can we continue to use the pool? The answer to that would be no, because what would happen is you'd be violating the governor's order on um, social distancing and gatherings um, which, so while your single family home can have the pool, um, that's not going to have an instance where there's people who don't live together, unless you're inviting people over in violation of the governor's order and you're, uh, gathering with 10 or more people in an area. Um, so that's why, you know, the community association pool still can't open. Um, hopefully that changes really soon. We're starting to see some stuff open like golf courses and everything. So who, who knows, maybe by, you know, um, uh, the Memorial Day weekend, the pools could open maybe shortly thereafter. And that's why Ben last week was really stressing to everyone, get your preparation in place, prepare the pool. You um, can prepare the pool to be open, but you just can't allow people to use it. You should be doing those things now. Yes. Okay. Thank you. So I'll, I'll turn to Ben for a second. What should a maintenance program for a pool look like 
while, whoop, change it, while we are waiting to open this season. I know you, you touched on it uh, a little bit, I guess, last week, but, um, you know, that's why we have these each week to do this. So, yeah. Um, so the, the pool maintenance program, like the activities that we're doing in our, in our markets are the same as we would be doing any other time this year. Uh, at, this year, we're doing the same things we would be doing any other year. Okay. Um, so for us at this point, it's business as usual, preparing the pool. Um, it takes, you know, usually two to three visits a week, uh, especially as the temperatures rise to treat the pool, do all the filtration functions that have to happen to keep it looking good. We stay in that holding pattern. Okay. So it's just that two to three times a week treatment and so on to carry it until such time that it becomes permissible and we can take the, the last steps to, to get open. Okay. Thank you, Ben. Uh, we're going to ask our resident IT expert, and this uh, week it's Nick, and appreciate you jumping on. How can I find the best Wi-Fi zone in my house? Does moving closer to my router always help improve Wi-Fi connectivity? Well, hello, everyone. I'm just going to uh, touch on this. is not a, a one-size-fits-all solution to this. Uh, parents are home. Kids are home. Google Meet, Hangouts, uh, Zoom, Teams, Skype. There's a lot of contention for wireless networking. Uh, yes, logic says the closer you are to your access point, the better performance you're going to have. But, you know, if your access point is in your basement and you're on the second floor, yeah, you may see some issues you wouldn't see on the first floor. At that point, it may be worth investigating the attic, you know, a, uh, a wireless repeater or another access point to stretch that network across your house. But there's no one there's no one size fits all i i definitely in this house we had a, a another router or whatever put in just to get the connectivity i'll throw one more at you nick sure uh how to conduct remote board meetings for people that do not have the pcs or smartphones or maybe they're not readily available for everyone are there telephone conferences for 300 plus communities absolutely so much like we're using zoom today and there's cisco webex and skype and there's a host of uh, private companies that offer audio only conferencing uh, in this case it sounds more like some people may some people may not have uh, computers or availability of technology besides an audio phone uh yeah um, even zoom conferencing today we could dial in uh, the audio people can hear it they may not participate video wise but they'd still be able to join the conference and a lot of them can go up to 10,000 users. Nice, thank you. Sure. All right, JJ, Juan Jose Chavez, a janitorial one on reopenings. Is there a reopening action plan clients can see specifically, uh, I guess we're disinfecting, janitorial cleaning uh, for tenants uh, moving back into offices and I imagine for residents going back into amenity space? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, Good afternoon, everyone. So I, I think it's, it's very important, just like the other panelists have been saying, now is the time to start doing all of this. So for example, us at PLAN, we do have a very uh, detailed, multi-directional plan where we will look at the site that is closed or at the area that is closed and put together a tailored program to get that space ready to be open. Uh, for example, we will be looking at the staffing require, uh, any type of a specialty equipment, how are we going to disinfect that area? Uh, and obviously, we will take into consideration the different components in that area, uh, from the type of furniture, if there are stairwells, if there are lobbies, if there are elevators or something like that, that have been closed. And based on all that information, we will put a very specific a scope of work and we will meet with the customer uh, either the property manager the board uh, of the building or, or the property manager and uh, we will you know explain exactly what we're going to be doing uh, and once again we will get the agreement and move forward with that project i think that another aspect to consider too this is not just a one-time thing and then open it and then things go back to normal I think what is important too, that is even after making sure that the area is clean and is ready disinfected, have a plan that will constantly monitor that area to make sure that we're doing everything that we can to keep that area clean. So yes, pre-opening is important, 
but it should be a continuous effort to making sure that we're doing everything we can. Bro. Especially, I guess, in the high touch areas, the elevators, stairwells, lobby areas, common areas, how often, how much that, that type of disinfecting work is going to happen and, and hold it to some type of uh, accountable standard, I guess, for what, what needs to happen next. Uh, absolutely. And I think that, again, you know, one thing that everybody is going through this at this moment is that we should be revisiting all those protocols. The way that we were cleaning buildings or the way the, clean, the buildings were being disinfecting before all this, uh, I, I believe that it's going to be very different moving forward, right? So from service hours to amount of people to frequency of disinfecting, uh, all those things should be look at it, review it, uh, you know, work with your janitorial provider if you outsource that or with your on-site team and uh, make sure that, you know, all those aspects are being covered. But use this as an opportunity to really look at all the protocols, all the operational <laughs> processes and go from there. Okay, thank you. I just lost the Zoom thing for a second. All right, going to Ray. From City Fire, I haven't, uh, we haven't heard from you yet, and there's a few. What are the most important fire inspections I should do? Is there a sorry, is there a priority? I'm gonna turn this phone off. Ray, can you hear me? Um, well, what I've been told, and what people have said, you know, the inspectors and, and people that uh, handle the um, inspections, the um, AHJs, obviously your sprinkler. If you have a sprinkler building, you want to make sure that we come in there do your sprinklers, make sure the water's flowing. Um, the second one would be uh, alarms. We wanna make sure that the alarms are working, horn and strobes, and most importantly, central station monitoring. Those two things are kind of connected. I would really say sprinkler number one, alarm number two, uh, to put it into perspective, like extinguishers. I was told by uh, someone from um, you know, the state that if you didn't get your extinguishers done, that's not as vital. Um, but you should get everything done while we're there. We should take care of all your equipment. But um, just to use common sense, just in case there's any uh, apprehension about us coming in or, or you know, getting inspections done, um, if you feel uncomfortable, um, things like that could be maybe left um, for a secondary tertiary type of inspection. But um, definitely get all your um, alarms and sprinklers done for sure. As the top priority. Top priority. Absolutely. Thank you. And then Dino, how might security be different as the economy opens? Thanks, Rob. Yeah, I think there'll be a lot of differences out of the gate. Uh, you know, people with social distancing and, as Martin pointed out, amenities opening up for different states at different times and controlling that. I think it's important that we monitor and we train our security and front desk staff the importance of sensitivity. People are on edge. People are going through a lot of changes in their homes and uh, enforcing policies uh, for your buildings is critical, but doing it with a customer service approach, understanding how important it is uh, to talk to people the right way now. We can train on security all day and how to enforce rules and regulations, and we can hand out a manual to anybody. What's important now is that people understand and we train them on how people are feeling. And I think, like Mr. Fazio pointed out earlier, the, the importance of people's feelings. And, and this is where, this is when the elite come out. This is when the strong show who they are. Um, so making sure security staff today and front desk personnel not only understand the importance of enforcing policies and procedures, but how to do it. And, and remembering the importance of sensitivity when talking to someone who may have been locked up in their unit for the last 45 days uh, and is now having the first face-to-face -face with right. your team member, how critical it is that they do that the right way and that they seize that moment and opportunity. Right. And communication is key with, with the staff and with the residents themselves, right? Because they could have been locked up or, or uh, quarantined for some time and now it's, they want to engage and understand what's happening and what are the protocols. So it's very, that's, key. that's critical and communication from the management to the residents. And this is opening up on this day. This is not opening up on this day. And, you know, that's critical. Absolutely. Thank you, sir. Thank Back you. to Jeff from Heartline. When gyms do reopen, 
How do you envision social distancing in the gym? Will there be large crowds right away? Uh, what will that first week or two look like? And you know, maybe even when you had mentioned, because the first question I think I asked was just about preparing. You know, maybe how do you see the first couple of weeks? You know. Yeah. No, this is a this is a great great question, um, and I could tell you what I know about this today versus three or four weeks ago uh, is very different. Uh, we've talked to several. Um, you know, club owners, amenity space, county rec centers, um, and really the, the preparation, it, a lot of it depends. I don't have a silver bullet here, right? But you've got different different graphics. You've got different types of spaces where you can spread things out. Obviously, there's the standard guidelines of six feet from CDC. I'm seeing everybody do more, okay? So seven feet, eight feet, 10 feet, even more around, you know, ellipticals, treadmills, bikes, things like that. The other thing that I think is really important besides some of these easy things to pluck off are how will you control the traffic into the facility, right? And, and not just through that door, right? Maybe you got a small door and you have a little yield sign that says, hey, somebody's trying to get out of that fitness center, yield to them, get out of the way, right, before you enter. The other thing that I think is significant too is uh, the picture behind me actually is a, a good example. Uh, there could be two entrances to this fitness center, right? And if I'm waiting to get on this treadmill that's, that's closest to me here and John's on it, I don't want John feeling uncomfortable because I'm standing right behind him waiting for him to finish, right? Uh, and also if people are coming at two different directions, you kind of want this hallway to flow one way and that's it right? Not where you've got people, you know, intersecting or passing each other, uh, whether they're wearing a mask or not, these types of things are going to create anxiety in that environment. So, you know, specifically answering the question, um, it depends on your space. I recommend doing more than just, you know, what CDC is recommending and then controlling the flow inside the facility and obviously controlling, um, you know, the membership, a key fob sure. to your amenity space, or hey, you know, so 10 people can only sign up between the hours of six and eight when we're open. Um, the last piece to this that I'll leave you with too is um, as we progress and things open up, do not lax on these types of initiatives, right? Because right. you won't have an issue, you won't have an issue, you get, bam, you got an issue, right? Right. So, Stay tight with it. Um, if it's working, it's working. It's working for a reason. Don't lose sight of that. I keep hearing it also about access controls just in terms of stairwells going up, stairwells going down. You're talking about people in the fitness area, how they may um, interact or intersect with one another. These are all very important questions, including for the elevators, how many people go on at one time? How are you spacing um, you know, residents or guests out in the elevators? Uh, and the flow of traffic. And those are all great discussion points. So thank you, good. Um, I'm gonna turn it back to JJ uh, on electrostatic cleaning that I keep hearing about in terms of uh, uh, use, uh, it's how productive, um, what your feeling on it is. Uh, I know there's a couple, I think, on this. So if you wanna just talk about it in general in terms of what you feel, uh, how electrostatic cleaning how effective it could be, where it would be used, that'd be great for the group. Yeah, thank you, Rob. Uh, yeah, this, mo most of you probably already have heard about it. It came out about, you know, three years ago. Uh, as you know, you know, it's, it's the electrostatic cleaning. Uh, it is basically a process where you apply a liquid uh, to a surface by charging uh, a solution while it's being charged by an electrical current as it exits the sprayer, right? So if this process is done the right way, uh, the surface is covered uh, evenly in a much faster way than using the typical spray bottle in microfiber cloth, right? Uh, so I will have to say to the question about, you know, is, is it necessary? It's not completely necessary. Uh, since there are other methods to disinfect the area. However, uh, if the possibility is there to utilize this method, I will, be, uh, I will say that is something that is highly recommended. 
And, uh, in terms of how effective it could be? Uh, yeah, well, and also how it can save time, right? So uh, it's definitely something that, you know, it can be done, the results are great, and it will save time, right? So I think there was another question there about... Is it a one-time service, or do you need to do it, uh, the frequency of it? Yeah, so it's, it's not a one-time process. So basically, you know, how we've been covering all this uh, during these presentations, you can disinfect an area, but if that area is accessed by uh, people and people, you know, that have infected or have the virus go ahead and touch it, then that area really is not disinfected anymore, right? So it's not a one-time service. It is a good process to add back to my answer before about, what program do we have moving forward once the area is open? Uh, is something great to be added on that recurring uh, program of cleaning program of an area, right? But it's not a one-time process just because you can clean it, but then it will get uh, infected or dirty or, or, or such uh, by the time that somebody uh, is somebody that has the virus or you know, has any type of uh, bacteria will, will get it infected. I think the other part was that, you know, uh, there's some comments there about, do we need to prepare uh, the area for electro, uh, electrostatic cleaning? Uh, so the answer on that is, is yes, there is some preparation that uh, it needs to happen. Obviously, hopefully this process is being applied by somebody that is properly trained, by somebody that is wearing the proper P personal protection e equipment. Uh, do you want to remove some of the paper products in that area? Uh, you want to remove that? Uh, another great suggestion also that we are implementing is that we are uh, putting a sign at the entrance of the area, alerting the uh, residents that this area is being treated at that particular moment to avoid coming into the area. That has definitely uh, worked out great uh, for us. Uh, another great thing about this is obviously uh, you know, once the, the area has been treated by this process, uh, it is safe to, uh, you know, walk in immediately. It does have a killing time depending on the chemistry that, that the organization is using uh, between, you know, one to two minutes. But other than that, it is, it is a good option. Uh, Cost-wise, it's on the higher end. So that is something that everybody should consider that as well. But again, work with your janitorial provider if it's not us or if you're doing it in-house and, uh, you know, you, you can take next steps as necessary from there. Thank right. you. Thank you. So let me ask, going back to uh, Michael Fazio, and there's a couple real quick and, and on the, for the panelists, because I know we only have, you know, in appreciation of everyone's time, there's, there's about, you know, seven minutes or, uh, left. I want to make sure I get to all the participants questions. So I want to make sure if you see one that I'm not getting to, feel free to make it interactive. But Michael, there was two asks that I think you would, you'd want to answer. What local geographic areas does live service? And, and I, I'm sure that that's something that, I, that you'd, you'd want to relate to the group. And that yes. was asked by someone I know in the industry quite well. So. Okay. Uh, we, we service the tri-state area and New Jersey. We also um, are currently expanding into South, actually into Florida. Um, and we operate and manage some spas on an international level from Grand Cayman to Honduras to California. Nice, nice. And then there was one other and it was just in front of me. So let me see if I can grab it for you real quick. Um, if not, I'll turn to someone else. Let me see if I can find it, Michael. And it was just about the programming itself. So let me just see. No, I'll get back to you in a second. These things come and go. This is, you know, this is what live television is. Um, Dino, was there anyone, I'll turn to you, that I'm looking at the list here and I want to honor the questions that are here. Uh, anyone that's, that's uh, jumping out that, that I'm not um, grabbing for the panelists. I want to make sure I give everybody uh, their due here. Yeah, absolutely. I, I did see uh, a question about security. How are people dealing with resident enforcement of wearing masks in common areas and the jurisdictions on site security? Uh, I think that would be a good one. And, I, and I'm going to ask Martin to piggyback with me on the legalities of it. Uh, but enforcing, uh, if it's a building 
protocol. So from a security standpoint, if, if the if your board of directors or if the building has decided that you must wear masks in common areas and you inform the security team to enforce it, well, with that, is it a violation? You'll have to let us know uh, how we report it back to the board, uh, et cetera. You'll let us know and, and security will enforce it from that standpoint. Martin, I'm curious on the legalities of that, if that's something that a, a building uh, can set as a protocol. Uh, I keep hearing from the governors that it, they re highly recommend wearing masks when you go outside, but I'm curious from, from a legal standpoint how that would apply. Sure, yeah. So what we've been telling our um, condo association clients is, and, and this is our interpretation of the governor's order, and you know, the association has authority to make rules and regulations governing the common elements and common affairs of, of an association, right? And that would include the use of amenity spaces, but everything like the lobby and the hallways as well, those are common areas. So if there is a high likelihood, and there is in all of those areas and all of these buildings we're talking about, that people are going to have to come within six feet with one another, meaning social distancing is not always possible, you can absolutely make it a rule that the residents in the building and anyone in the building has to wear a mask when they're in the hallways, when they're on the elevators, when they're in the lobby, when they're in any common areas. I agree. Enforcement is a bit tricky. So first part of that question is, can you make it a rule? Yes. I, I, under the governing order, I think uh, an association would have the authority to do that because it's something that's being recommended, not just by the governor, but by the CDC, right? So that's a reasonable basis to make a reasonable rule in this circumstance. Now, once those recommendations go away, once the governor's order goes away, that'll change. Obviously, you wouldn't have the authority to require someone to wear a mask, uh, barring these recommendations from the CDC and, and the governor's order. Enforcement's a little bit tricky, yeah. You obviously don't want um, your members or your staff probably having to come within six feet of these people themselves, right? And no one's suggesting anyone's going to do anything physical in the sense of security, rough anyone up or anything like that. Um, but I think the process you pointed out is correct. You uh, alert the, the board and the board hopefully has some process for either enforcement or fining. Now, I, I'm strongly against, you know, first time offender, uh, you know, sending them a fine in almost any circumstance for a condo association. I, I think these are your neighbors. These are the people you live with. You want to reach out to them. You want to explain why the rule's in place. Make sure they understand the rule, that there is a rule in place, why it's important, why the board did it, where the authority comes from to do it. And you're probably best doing that over the phone than in a letter, right? Um, you can involve your legal counsel for a first-time offense. I, I generally say don't do it. People get a, a little, you know, in intimidated when legal counsel's involved. For something like this, try to remember there that you know they're your neighbors. You live in a community. Um, I'm more than happy with any of our clients to help the manager in in giving them sort of a, a dialogue that they should communicate and and go from there. But yeah, if you have an habitual offender, maybe the solution is you have to find them. It's you know, and I, I hate to see um, people you know do that. But in this current environment, it's it's very reasonable to require the the masks. But so I think you have the right philosophy, Martin, in terms of yeah. these are your neighbors. I've got two, Dino, then we can that for from, yes, the, from the participants, one for Martin here, I think on that same line, but can can we restrict homeowner guests to the pool and the and the gym? Um, yeah, uh, well, right now understanding that in New Jersey anyway, they're not supposed to be open in the first place. Um, when you get to a period where they can be open, it'll depend on what the governor's orders say, what the CDC is recommending, much like how right now we believe it's reasonable to have the masks. If they were to um, open the pools, um, but keep these mask rules in effect, for example, or keep the social distancing rule in effect, I think it'd be very reasonable to say you can't bring guests to the pool, residents only for the time being. That may be something that is a requirement of an executive order at some point, you know. Um, the, the, the governor may say you can open your pools in communities provided it's residents only and, you know, your social distancing and, um, and, and it may be the case that, you know, you can only have so many people in the pool at a time in right. that area. Maybe they have to get 90 minutes or a half hour. I think, I think um, uh, JJ mentioned last time that down by them, they were doing, you know, signing up and you could go to the pool for 90 minutes because only so many people could go at a time. That's something you might see up here eventually too in New Jersey. Thank you, Martin. And Michael Fazio, I found the question that I was looking for and I'll wrap it up with you. Who pays for the virtual programming? Does the building pay uh, the fitness instructor to do these classes for the residents or how does that work? Yes, well, you always get what you pay for. So, 
<laughs> so yes, buildings typically build this into their budget, something that we um, are happy to consult on. Um, and some buildings will try to offset the cost by charging residents. Other buildings just use it as an operating expense. And again, it's knowing that they're providing a service to residents that will keep them engaged, engage residents who are more likely to retain the more retention, the higher the value of the building. So, and we're not talking gigantic numbers, but it's definitely something that needs to be planned for. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. And Dino, I will turn it to you. And again, if anything I, you know, left off on this, there's been a, a, a barrage of questions. <laughs> no, thank you, Rob, and great job. And, and one of the questions was, can you access uh, the slides from our presentation? And just want to point out, and as you can see on your screen now, on our planned company website in the COVID section, every single week we post this presentation uh, and we keep them all out there. So feel free to go back. If there was ever something you wanted to rewatch or share with your teams, that's the place to find it and we'll keep doing it. I wanna thank all of our panelists today for a wonderful job. Uh, Michael Fazio, great 17 years of knowing you, my friend. Excellent job today. Liv is doing phenomenal stuff out there and we really appreciate the participation. Next week, we will have Certa Pro painters talking to you about maybe thinking about doing projects while your buildings are empty right now. This could be a great time to think about those painting projects that maybe you put off because it was hard to, uh, to get done. So they'll be with us next week. Looking forward to that. As always, when you leave today, we will ask you for suggestions. This is, as we started, it's about you, for you. With that said, I'd like to go to our poll answers. Uh, Nick, do we have the uh, results of our poll from today? Uh, sure, Dino. Give me one quick second. Great. And while he's doing that, oh, there we go. He did that. There we go. So it looks like... <laughs> Tuesday is the winner. Is that right? It looks like, uh, yeah. Tuesday is the winner by a uh, one percentage. Yes. Fantastic. And like I mentioned earlier, the reason we asked that question today is we are considering a lot of you have reached out to me and the, and the team and said, hey, these Thursdays at two are becoming a bit of a challenge. So if we do decide to move it over to another day, we really would appreciate you following us. Uh, we, we love having you here. We love our slot but we want to get the most value for everyone. And we, want, we don't want to be inconvenient for anybody. So uh, we certainly are considering that. Thank you so much. Panelists, as always, I'm going to ask you to fade to black at this point. Thank, Thank you, you for, uh, for joining Thank us you. today. Great job, Michael. Great job, panelists. Thank you. Go ahead and, and close it down, panelists. For those of you, our participants, we like to end it. And let's see if we can do it with some of my favorite music. And while that's happening, uh, we are going to leave this screen on for you to take some notes. You have uh, Liv's website remaining. And uh, once again, just thank you so much for, for joining us today. And we look forward to seeing you next week. Thank you.